want to um, thank you all for having me t- today. It's my honor to be with you all tonight. Uh, mashallah to uh, have such a focused group of sisters, alhamdulillah, that are consistently meeting and, um, you know, and, and working on these on these different topics and things of that sort to better themselves. Um, I also want to point out that I did not write my own bio. I'm not a fan of my own bio at all. Um, <laughs> I don't know why they put these bios online, but Allah must add, I'm stuck with whatever is up there. Um, but, you know, in essence, it, you know, the topic that we're talking about, for those of you that have taken the class that I've taught with um, Al-Maghrib on behind the scenes, we go into a lot of depth on this topic, which is the topic of pride and arrogance. And a lot of times, you know, whenever we talk about pride and arrogance, at least in the English language, it's, you know, the, the words are really just kind of interchangeable. But in the Arabic language, there are very specific and in Islam and in the sciences of Tesca, very specific uh, types of arrogance and pride um, that the Prophet wasallam warned us about. So you have the mother of them all, which is kibir, okay, which is pride. Right? The best definition of kibir is pride. Then you have hubbul jah wa riyasa, which is love of prestige. Uh, Al-jah is celebrity or prestige. Love of prestige wa riyasa is leadership. Then you have riya, okay? Riya is obviously the love of showing off or the, or the act of showing off. Then you have al ujb, which is uh, being self-conceited, okay? Or being amused by yourself, being ple- uh, pleased with yourself. Now, going through the different uh, the different levels here, and, and obviously because of the shortage of time, I can't really go into detail with each and every single one of them, but, you know, uh, all of these different forms of pride are related to each other. Okay, they're all related to each other, and you know because, for example, if a per- and, and subhanallah, if a person is consistently involved with people, so you can basically go through each and every single one of these categories, and you can see that one of the main problems, one of the major issues, is that a person is too involved with people's business. Okay, and when a person becomes too involved with people's business, and a person does not have enough uh, time to themselves, enough. Um, time of solitude and introspection, then they're going to fall into one of these diseases. So, for example, kibir. Rasulullah said that whoever has an atom's worth of kibir in his heart will not enter paradise. And, you know, one of the Sahaba said to the Prophet that, Ya Rasulullah, a person loves to have nice clothes and nice shoes. And the Prophet said, Inna Allah jameel yuhibbul jamal. Allah is beautiful and Allah loves beauty. And he said, but rather kibir, the kibir that would actually expel a person from paradise is ghamtu nas wa batarul haq is to belittle people, to judge people. Okay? Ghamtu nas is, is literally, so it has in it ghamt as in it uh, belittling and judging. Okay? Or judging as a result of belittling that person, not giving them their proper regard, so then therefore you pass judgment upon them. And then um, rejecting the truth. And Imam Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, he said about this, he said that the reason why these two types of pride and arrogance actually expel a person from paradise, actually would forbid a person from entering into paradise, is because they are two sole rights to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which are legislation, at tasri' wal hukum legislation and judgment. Only Allah has the right to legislate. So who am I to deny the truth or to express my opinion on a matter when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already expressed that opinion? So in essence, the worst form of pride is intellectual pride. You know, Imam Hassan al-Basri, rahimahullah, he said the, 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 you know, intellectual pride is the hardest type of pride to solve. And subhanAllah, we see people get carried away with their degrees and with their jargon and, you know, and their ability to speak eloquently. And then all of a sudden you see them expressing opinions that contradict what Allah and the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam have already spoken of, and, and Allah subhanahu wa taala, um, He tells us in the Quran that no one has the right to express and yakuna lahum al not to even have a choice in a matter, after Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam have expressed the choice on a matter. So it's not just saying, uh, you know, akfur bidalik, you know, I, I disbelieve in this and I disbelieve in that, but rather it's expressing an opinion khiyar after Allah and his messenger, so I somehow have expressed an opinion on a matter. Okay, so this is a person who becomes overly impressed with his intellect, overly impressed with his jargon, or is trying to escape commitment. All right, so, you know, if I can't live up to the standard, then I'm going to bring the standard down to me, to my level. 
right? So if I can't live up to this, then you know what? I'm going to change a ruling that's been there for 1,400 years because I can't live up to that ruling. And this is the worst form of pride and arrogance. You know, we don't even consider this arrogance sometimes, but this is the worst form of arrogance because look what you're saying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, you're saying that despite you creating me and despite you giving me an abode in this world and giving me all of these blessings that you've given me, I'm not willing to do it. I'm not willing to do the basics that you've asked me to do. So I'm not, not only am I going to, to not do it, you know, at, at, the very, at the very least, a person would admit would admit fault and would admit imperfection on their part, right? And that might be enough, you know, just to exp- at the very least admit guilt and, and, you know, say, you know, I couldn't do it, I tried, or, you know, I need to get better, right? At the very least, you know, you could do that. But whenever, not only are you, you know, are you falling short, but you're not even willing to acknowledge that and you're bringing the bar down and saying this is where the bar is actually supposed to be, that is the greatest form of pride because that form of pride deals directly with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, you're not expressing. So, ghamtun nas is belittling people. Batur al-haq is seeking to belittle Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, denying the truth or expressing your opinion on a matter. After Allah and the Messenger وسلم, have expressed their opinion on something, is actually you're actually trying to belittle Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why that is absolute kufr. You know, one letter, one word of the Qur'an or an authentic hadith to deny it or to say, I don't agree with this or I think it means this after the Prophet وسلم, already said what it means. Is you are trying is an attempt to belittle Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and no one uh, tries to mock Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala or belittle Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, except as Allah tells us in Surah Al Baqarah, "Yuqadiyoon Allah wa Ladina Amanu, wa na yuqadiyoon illa anfusahum, wa na yashurun." They try to deceive Allah and those who believe, and at the end of the day, they're only deceiving and deluding themselves because you're not going to hurt Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Okay, so it's very important, the greatest, the, the most important arrogance and pride that we have to to shy away from, to make sure that we don't have any um, connection with, is when we're actually trying to put ourselves in the position of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So first and foremost, the way we approach the Qur'an and the Sunnah, we should approach it with humility. That yes, oh Allah, I'm going to try. Okay, I will try to meet this. I'm going to humbly try. This is my humble effort. And subhanAllah, the believer despite doing much more than what everyone else around him is doing. You know, think about this. The believer does much more. You know, they're ghuraba, they're strangers in their nature. They do much more than the people around them, right? But they are more afraid of meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the people around them, and that is humility, okay? So a person who never prays, a person who, you know, who does not do the basics, um, you know, that person has no fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and doesn't care about meeting him and will openly mock Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But a person who does, who tries to present everything that they can uh, goes to Allah with humility. You know, like, I'm trying my best and, and I hope Allah, out of his mercy, will accept it. Not because of how amazing my good deeds are, but out of his mercy will accept it. So if you can't have humility with the Creator, you're not going to have humility with the creation. It's as simple as that. And that's why you'll find people that are arrogant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are arrogant with everybody else. Think about this. You know, atheists, you know, people that are agnostic, people that mock Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're the most arrogant people in the world. They're arrogant not just with Allah, but they're actual they're actual they're they're actually very prideful human beings in person. Right? You know, because if you if you can't even be humble with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then how are you going to be humble with the people? So anyway, that's the first type, which is approaching the scripture and approaching Allah and the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the bounds that they have set for us. The second part of that is ghamtun nas, putting down people, putting down people. So again, you're too involved with people's business. You constantly monitor people's business. You constantly see what everybody else is doing. And so naturally, you gain a hypocritical outward eye rather than a sincere inward-looking eye. Okay? And as Hassan al-Basr rahim Allah said, من علامات إعراض الله تعالى عن العبد أن يسعله فيما لا يعني from the signs that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has abandoned an individual whenever he becomes busy with everybody else's business. So how are you going to be humble when you're constantly seeing everyone's fahsha, everyone's public sins on Facebook, on Twitter, whatever it is, when you're constantly following people and monitoring people's business, when the only, the only conversation um, in, in gatherings is talking about how everybody else is falling short. So naturally you're going to start to see, you're going to start to see other people in a negative light. Right? And subhanAllah, you know, it's when the Prophet says 
that من حسن الإسلام المرئي that from the goodness of a person's Islam تركه ما لا يعني is his abandoning that which does not concern him. You know, you cannot perfect true submission unless you abandon that which does not does not concern you. Unless you don't you don't uh, you know keep yourself indulged in that, because that is going to allow pride to seep in, and that's going to corrupt all of your good deeds, right? So in essence, again, you're too involved with people's business, so you start to see the faults of the others. Uh, you start to belittle them naturally, okay? Because you you see how bad they are all the time, and, and naturally, you know, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has given us all the same um, the same amount of time. Right, and this, uh, within a day, obviously, some of us will die earlier than others. But Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has given us all the same amount of time in a day. All right, how you occupy that 24 hours? Every hour that I use monitoring other people's business, I'm not doing muraqab of myself. I'm not monitoring myself. Every hour that I waste in someone else's business means I'm not I'm not focusing on myself. Okay, so it's important to look at the time that you spend on other people's faults and on other people's business so that you don't fall into that same problem. And subhanAllah, as a result of that, not only will you start to look down upon people and belittle people, but your eye will be extremely hypocritical. Okay? As the, as the saying uh, goes, أَتَرَ الْقَذَاتَ فِي عَيْنِ أَخِيكَ You see a small t- uh, twig in the eye of your brother, but you, you don't see a huge tree in your own eye. Meaning what? A person who has a lot of sins, but because they're looking at someone else's sin, and perhaps that sin that the other person is doing is more condemned in society. There is more looked down upon in, in the community because it has more of a public shameful, uh, shameless nature to it. Okay, So perhaps I start to neglect my own sins because I see the other person's sins. All right? So the, the believer has basira. They look at themselves. There's introspection. I don't, I'm not looking at everybody else. So kibir again, so kibir can develop uh, because you're too involved in people's business. Okay, so riya can also hub al jahu riya san riya, which is so hub al jahu riya, we said is love of celebrity and leadership, and riya is the is the practice of hub al jahu riya san. So riya is when you actually act upon that love that you develop for prestige and for leadership. Both of those things, in essence, you you know you develop a love for doing your good deeds publicly and that praise that comes with it. Okay, so naturally you're always getting praised for your good deeds because you're always doing your good deeds publicly. So what have you left for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So again, you're spending too much time in the sight of the people and doing things for the sight of the people rather than for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And again, you're too involved with people. Okay, you're too involved with their opinions. You're too involved with what they think about you. You know, and subhanAllah, that, the, the facade of the nafs, the corruption of the heart and the soul that will come from riyah, is not just having your actions rejected, okay, because in essence you're making those people gods besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you're seeking their approval rather than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's approval, but you'll actually start to do things. You'll actually start to, to take positions and do things um, that are contrary to what Allah and the Messenger have, have commanded because they're not as popular. Um, and they're not as they're not as, as praiseworthy in the public sight as you know another stance or another another um, action or another position. Okay, and subhanAllah, that could actually lead you to the first form of kibbutz, right? That could bring you to the dalaj of kibbutz, to the level of kibbutz. Because you know what? If I've developed an obsession for what people think about me, and in order to maintain people's love of me, I have to do certain things, then I'm going to do those things, even if they're against what Allah and the Messenger said to them have. You know, uh, against what Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi have legislated. Okay, so riyah can lead to kibir too. It's a manifesta- it, it can become a manifestation of kibir. But again, you're looking for the people's approval. So kibir is that you're using your sight to belittle people. Okay, to belittle people. Riyah is when you're using the sight of people to motivate you rather than the sight of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Okay, again, both times you're too involved with people's business and their opinions. And then you have al-urjb, al-urjb, okay, which is whenever you become, uh, whenever you become abused by yourself, you know the good deeds that you do, and so you're so proud of those good deeds that you constantly remind yourself of those good deeds. So you, you constantly tell yourself about how great you are. And the Prophet ﷺ said, "Lola tuznibun khashaytu alaykum ma akbaru min dalik." Al-urjb, al-urjb. 
if you are not to sin, I would fear for you something far worse than sin, and that's urjb. That's whatever, and he said it twice, and urjb, urjb, which comes from ajab, right? Something that is amusing, something that is strange, something that is that is great, right? And, and, and great in a unique way, okay? So urjb is when you see yourself in that way, you become amused by yourself. You see yourself as unique, and you see yourself as as great. You see yourself as as better than the people around you. Again, you know people's faults too much. So now your sight is on yourself, but your sight to yourself is dangerous because you're looking to yourself and you're saying, MashaAllah, I do this, but other people don't do this. <laughs> you see? SubhanAllah. So again, so you look through Kibir, Riyah, Urj, it's, it's a perverted uh, way of looking at things in all, in all of those different categories. Okay, But in essence, a person needs to develop a level of solitude a person needs to develop a level of introspection. A person needs to have their own accountability that they're taking of themselves in order to progress in this manner. Right? And, and subhanAllah, we see that ikhlas, sincerity, can enter, can cause a person to be entered into Jannah with nothing, you know, with, with, with close to nothing in terms of good deeds. You know, I mean, they haven't attained much, they haven't done much. So the Prophet Sallallahu tells us, for example, about the man who uh, at the time of his death ordered that his body be burned to ashes. You know, cremation in essence. Why? Because he feared Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He knew that he didn't do much. And he feared Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raises that man on the day of judgment and asks him, why did you do that? And he says, خَشَيْتُكَ يَا رَبَّ أَنْ تَعْنَمْ I was just afraid of you, O oh Allah, and you know best. And Rasulullah sallallahu said, فَغَفْرَ اللَّهُ لَهُ بِذَلِكَ Allah forgave him because of the action. Because of his, because of the sincerity behind that action, even though that action is a major sin, because there was sincerity. So sincerity can cause a person with with very very few deeds, very few deeds, to enter into paradise and to be forgiven by Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Kibir, pride, can cause thousands of years of worship, as it did with Iblis, thousands of years of worship to go to complete and utter waste. Okay, you know what will those thousands, year, thousands of years of worship that Iblis had to his name? What will those thousands of years of worship do for him on the day of judgment? Absolutely nothing, zero, right? Zero. Why? Because a little bit of pride spoils a lot of good deeds, whereas a little bit of sincerity extols very, very few good deeds. It make it magnifies the blessings of very, very, very few good deeds. So trying to find ikhlas in your amal sincerity in your actions, trying to look for, you know, for sincerity in your actions, and that takes introspection, that takes contemplation, that takes sitting down with myself and thinking, you know, is this for Allah, is this for Allah, is this for Allah, is this for Allah, reminding yourself, is this for Allah, is this for Allah, you know, ask yourself, and this is the, this is the, the crux, the essence of re- renewing your intention before every ibadah, it's not something that's spoken, speaking is that has the opposite effect, we don't speak our intentions, that's the yeah. <laughs> You don't speak your intentions. That's a form of arrogance. Renewing your intentions is, is the thought process that you go through before you do any good deed. The reminder that you give yourself, and the reminder that you give yourself is greater than any reminder you'll hear from anybody else. The reminder that is an honest dialogue between you and yourself that leads to an exchange between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is greater than any khutbah, greater than any lesson, greater than any lecture you will hear the reminder of the self to the self, because you know yourself better than anyone else knows you, except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it starts off, so how do we start to remedy this, um, you know, remedy all of these different forms of pride? It's within three facets, three facets. So the first one is know yourself, is to know yourself, okay, to learn about yourself and to know yourself. And knowing yourself has within it different subcategories. So the first part of knowing yourself is to know your just to know the nature of your creation okay know the nature of your creation Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala consistently reminds us in the Quran where we came from okay where we came from so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says قُتِلَ الْإِنسَانُ مَا أَكْثَرَ مِنْ أَيِّ شَيْءٍ خَلَقَ مِنْ نُطُفَةٍ خَلَقَهُ فَقَدَّرَهُ ثُمَّ السَّبِيرَ يَسَّرَ ثُمَّ أَمَاتَهُ فَأَقْضَرَهُ ثُمَّ إِذَا شَاءَ أَنْشَرَهُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds you that 
you know, he reminds, he says, قُتِلَ الْإِنسَانُ مَا أَكْفَرُ How disbelieving an ungrateful man is, you know, uh, where, you know, مَا أَكْفَرَ What caused him to disbelieve? مِنْ أَيِّ شَيْءٍ خَلَقَ What was he created from in the first place? مِنْ نُطُفَ He was created from a dirty drop of fluid. خَلَقَهُ فَقَدَّرَ and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created that drop of fluid. So you didn't even come from that drop of fluid on your own. Allah created the drop of fluid in the first place. And Allah proportioned the drop of fluid. So you are not responsible for the drop of fluid being there, nor are you responsible for what the drop of fluid becomes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created it. فَقَدَّرَ Allah proportioned it. And then you know what? You wouldn't have been able to get out of your mother's stomach had it not been for the miracle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. ثُمَّ السَّبِيلَ يَسْفَ Allah made it easy for you. Allah made a sabid is the path. Allah made the path easy for you. And Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says that the sabid in this ayah is referring to two things. It's referring to the path, literally the path, as in how you exit your mother's stomach. And the second one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is referring to the path as in sabidillah, as in the path of Allah, the path of Islam, the path of Iman, the path of worship. So in essence, you didn't get here spiritually except by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala nor did you get here physically except by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who do you think you are you did not get to this level spiritually or physically except by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and no matter what level you reach from the amatahu fa'akbara whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to take your life Allah will take your life and when and you will have no power as far as where you go afterwards fa'akbara you will end up in the grave and whenever Allah wants, whenever Allah wants, He will bring you back. So you have no power over how you are brought back, nor can you decree when you will be brought back. SubhanAllah, look at how humbling this ayah is. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, You know, hasn't there come upon man a time when he was not even something to be recognized? You know? How people become proud because of their family names, because of their races, because of what they think they've accomplished in life, because of their degrees, because of their titles. What were you, you know, a hundred years ago? Nothing, right? What was I a hundred years ago? Absolutely nothing. And then even the way we were brought into existence was, you know, subhanAllah, was from dirt, was from Najasa even. And that's why, you know, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, Rabbi Allah, Taqdani, he sent a letter to Kisra and he says, وَيْلَكَ أَتَتَكَبَّرُ عَلَى اللَّهِ وَقَدْ خَرَسْتَ مِنْ مَخْرَدِ الْبَوْرِ مَرَّتَيْنِ Woe to you! Are you showing kibir with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Are you placing yourself on a higher level than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because kibir comes from um, elevation, kabir, right? Great. Are you placing yourself on a higher level than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? وَقَدْ خَرَسْتَ مِنْ مَخْرَدِ الْبَوْرِ مَرَّتَيْنِ And you came from the private flight, from the private part from the place where urine is excreted twice. You know, look how dirty you are, subhanAllah. Look where you came from. So to, to humble yourself and to remind yourself, what were you before? So knowing yourself as in knowing your creation. Okay, so bringing, grounding yourself in terms of understanding your creation and where you came from. And then the second facet of that is to know your sins. Know your faults. Okay? So again, the inward-looking eye an introspection. Um, and Imam Ibn al-Jawzi, rahimahullah, he said that know that if people are impressed with you, then in reality they are impressed with Allah's covering of you. SubhanAllah, if people are impressed with you, they're impressed with Allah's covering of you. They're not impressed with you for who you are because they don't know you for who you are. They know the cover that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to you and I. But, but they don't know, I mean, they don't know how you are at night. They don't know how you are when you're alone, they don't know how you are when you deal with certain people. They don't know how you are in your salah. They don't know how you are. No one knows how you are. No one knows how I am, except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Ibn al-Jawzi rahimahullah says, if people are impressed with you, it's not because of who you are. It's because of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed as adornment for you, the covering that Allah has given for you. So recognizing your, you know, that, you know what, I'm not that great. You know, even if people want to say, even if people think I am, I'm not that much. And then and, and what that takes is to actually focus and enumerate your faults. Sufyan al-Thawri, rahimahullah, used to sit down and count his sins, reflect on all of the sins he's committed in his life. And subhanAllah, 
you know, the sins that Sufyan Saudi committed in his entire lifetime are probably what we commit in, in one day in terms of lowering our gaze feet and in terms of um, bad language or in terms of backbiting and, you know, the sins that Sufyan Saudi you know, committed. And, and he would become so frightened with himself. He'd sit there for hours. And subhanAllah, we don't find one ayyab, one fault of this person in his entire life, right? But that's introspection, focusing on your faults. So in essence, every time you happen to come across something bad in someone else, you shouldn't be delving in other people's affairs anyway. Okay, when you see a fault of someone, make dua for them. Make dua that Allah guides them. Because uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu said, when you make dua for someone, Allah Subhanahu there's an angel that says, Ameen, walaka bi mithli, aw walaka mithlu. Ameen, and for you the same. So when you see someone who's falling short and you've come across that and you're aware of that fault, make dua for the person. Say, Ya Allah, guide him. Ya Allah, this is a good person. You know, she's a good person. I know her heart. I know what I know about her. Guide that person. You know, they're not like that. They're better than that. Make dua for that person. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow an angel to make dua for you. Okay, so every time you see something bad in someone else, immediately make dua for that person and then remind yourself of a fault that they don't know about or a fault that you have that they don't have. Right? Remind yourself of one of your faults. And then if someone else comes to you and points something good in you, if someone comes to you and tells you about how great something about you is or says something good about you, while that external conversation is taking place, when someone is praising you, talk to yourself and remind yourself of yourself. Remind yourself of a fault of yours. So focus on a fault of yours and remind yourself of that fault. And that would bring you back to your level. And subhanAllah, you know, a lot of, a lot of times when someone praises you, and, you know, the, the whole discussion of flattery is, is another story, you know, where the Prophet ﷺ, uh, he said, You know, you've broken the back, the neck of your brother. Um, you know, when you flatter him too much, you know, we should be grateful, we should thank people, we should, but we shouldn't flatter people because we really could hurt their sincerity. But, you know, just an advice, honestly, when someone praises you, don't respond back and say, no, I'm not like that, and no, you don't know what you're talking about, because if you do that, they're going to praise you more, <laughs> right? It's, it's going to lead to more praise. Inadvertently, it's going to lead to more praise. So when they do that, just put your head down and talk to yourself. You know, say astaghfirullah and tell yourself about the faults that you have. Remind yourself of the faults of yours that people don't know about. And then the last one is whenever, you know, remind yourself of your lack of private good deeds. And Imam Sufyan al-Thawri, rahimahullah, he said, every deed that I have manifested to the people, I do not count it as being anything. SubhanAllah, every deed that I have manifested to the people, I don't count it as being anything. Okay, so look at, you know, when people say, you know, MashaAllah, for your good deeds and things of that sort, remind yourself about, you know, how, how you're falling short on a private level. So that would cause you to increase on a private level. So again, reminding yourself of yourself. And this is, you know, again, it comes from interacting with people too much, getting too involved with people's business and getting too involved with people's opinion. And subhanAllah, this is more about the, this is more on the kibbutz issue, the know yourself more than anything else on, on the issue of kibbutz. Um, but you know, one, one very quick tip, um, is, you know, let your interaction with people always be in the capacity of service. Either you're serving them with a smile, either you're serving them with your good character, with good manners, you're lightening, you know, you're lighting up their day, you're making them feel better, you're giving them nasiha, right, you're enjoining good and forbidding evil, and that's the spiritual service, if you will, you know, and, you know, giving someone a smile, and then physically serving people, you know, always be the person in the gathering that's physically serving people. Always let your interaction with people be that you're holding the door for someone. You're you're serving some pe you're serving people because then then your interaction with the people is not being counterproductive as it mostly is in terms of your sincerity, but it's actually being productive. You're actually bringing yourself down. Okay, so to constantly remind yourself, and this was the etiquette of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Although he didn't need that because the Prophet there was no fear on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam of developing kibbutz or something of that sort. He's ma'asum. Okay, he's infallible. But still, the fact that the Prophet ﷺ sat with the people on the same level, he served the people. Aisha radiallahu anha says he used to fix his own shoes, clean his own clothes. You know, he would take care of himself. Abu Darda radiallahu anha says that when someone would come to visit, they wouldn't know which one amongst us is the Prophet ﷺ. So they'd, they'd look around for some time because he was sitting on the ground like everybody else. He 
dressed like everybody else. Alhamdulillah, he didn't he didn't make it a point to draw attention to himself. Sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That's beautiful. The Rizal radiallahu anhu says we wanted to make a mound for him. Just you know, he refused a, a seat, so he wanted to just, you know take a build, you know basically push a bunch of dirt into one place so it would become like a mound at least, so that he would sit on that and he'd be a little bit elevated. And he refused that alayhi salatu wasallam. So let your interaction with people always be in the capacity of service. So that's the first facet, again, which is to know yourself. The second one, which is to know your Lord, subhanahu wa ta'ala, to know Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is really what, it, you know, it, it boils down to in terms of, you know, a person who knows Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, will know themselves, and the person uh, will know themselves. Okay? لا تكونوا كالذين نسوا الله فأنساهم أنفسهم Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says do not be like a person who forgot Allah and so they were Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused them to forget themselves so when you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you'll accomplish the first one when you know your Lord you'll accomplish knowing yourself anyway okay why? because you will come to understand that you know what you'll think of all the favors Allah has done for you all the good Allah has done for you uh, how helpless and dependent you are upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And all of those are, are humbling factors. Okay, the things Allah has let you go with. All right? And then, so that's as far as the, the pride aspect. And then as far as riyah is concerned, as far as showing off and things of that sort and manifesting your needs to the public and developing that type of arrogance, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَلَا ذِكْرُ اللَّهِ أَكْبَرُ And the mention of Allah is greater. وَلَا ذِكْرُ اللَّهِ أَكْبَرُ Not وَلَا ذِكْرُ اللَّهِ أَكْبَرُ وَلَا ذِكْرُ اللَّهِ أَكْبَرُ And Ibn Abbas رضي الله عنه says, you know, and you hear this at the end of every khutbah and things of that sort, وَلَا ذِكْرُ اللَّهِ أَكْبَرُ Ibn Abbas says, that's not your mention of Allah, that's Allah's mention of you. When Allah mentions you. So in essence, you're seeking the mention of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the hadith Qudsi, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَمَنْ ذَكَرَنِي فِي نَفْسِي Whoever makes mention of me to himself, I make mention of him to myself. And whoever makes mention of me to a group, then I make mention of him to a greater group. Okay, in, in, in front of a greater group. Amongst the angels and the and things of that sort. So in essence, instead of seeking the praise of people, seek the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And actually imagine the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, and look for that praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And, and have confidence that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making mention of you and is rewarding you whenever you do things seeking his pleasure. And if you can start to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and develop that relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you won't care about the people. Right? If there are two people that are sitting in a room, one of them is of a much higher level and status. Okay? Not just not just in a pompous way, but just in every way possible. One of them is far greater than the other. And you 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 enjoy conversing with that person. You know, you know that you benefit from conversing with that person, things of that sort. You know, you're always going to choose the one who is really of that high quality and high status, right? In essence, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always with you, right? Obviously not physically in that regard, but the point is that you always are having this choice between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the sight of Allah and the sight of the people. Okay, so when you when you develop a relationship and an awareness of Allah subhanahu wa taala, as Ibn Al Qayyim rahimahullah said, "La yarif al khalq wal khaliq ahad, thumma yusir ma'amla al khalq ala al khaliq." No one knows al khalq wal khaliq, the creation and the creator, and then chooses chooses to do mu'amala, chooses the or chooses to be dealt with by the creation rather than the creator chooses the sight of the creation rather than the creator, chooses the approval of the creation rather than the creator. Right? Because he has a relationship with the creator, so he knows himself, he knows his position. You automatically know your role. Okay? You automatically learn your own role whenever you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, you know, Bishr al Hafi Rabbi Allah ta'ala al um he said, you know, do not seek to be celebrated in dunya because that might deprive you of being celebrated in the Akhirah. Right? So even the mention of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the Day of Judgment, you know, the mention of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that crowd, you know, some people would have would have done everything for the sake of people, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to them, as is narrated 
and Muslim Imam Ahmed in an authentic hadith, Allah would say to those people, اِذْهَبُوا إِلَى الَّذِينَ كُنْتُمْ تُرَعُونَ فِي الدُّنْيَا فَانْظِرُوا هَلْ تَجِدُونَ عِنْدَهُمْ جَزَاءً You know, run to those people that you used to seek approval from in the dunya and look to see if they have anything to give to you today. Right? They'll have nothing to give to you that day. They can't, لَا يَنْفُرُونَكُمْ وَلَا يَنْتَصِرُونَ You know, they don't, this is of course talking about shirk and the gods and things of that sort that they would not, they can't help themselves, nor they can't help you, nor can they help themselves. And this also reveals uh, shirk al-mahabba, which is loving someone the way you should love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, working for the approval of someone the way you should be working for the approval of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They won't be able to benefit you, nor will they be able to benefit themselves. So knowing your Lord is extremely crucial and extremely important in that time. Um, and subhanAllah, where did the time go? I'm already at the last five minutes, six minutes of this before Q&A. So the third one is to remember death. Remember death. Why remember death? Because we all end up in the same situation. So when you feel proud of yourself, when you feel a sense of pride and a sense of superiority, remember that you will be decayed bones in this world. And the only thing that would have any form of nobility would be the soul. And if you haven't worked on beautifying the soul, then you would be a disgraced person um, at the time of death. You know, because the, the bones and the stature and the status, all that will do nothing for you at that point. The only thing that is, that is, that is uh, noble is the soul at that point. Okay, everyone will be equal. Uh, people of different, um, you know, uh, people that are that have different levels of wealth, people that have different levels of, um, of, of fame and popularity, people that come from different races and backgrounds, whatever it is, everyone is going to be equal at that point. So, uh, you know, remind yourself so that you don't belittle people. And at the same time, so this is also a way of knowing yourself. Um, you know, Ka'b al-Quradi, Ka'b al-Quradi was one of the, the close friends of Amr ibn Abdul Aziz, rahimahullah ta'ala. And one time he walked in on Umar ibn Abdul Aziz after returning from a journey. And at, this was a time that Umar ibn Abdul Aziz became the Khalifa. And we know when Umar ibn Abdul Aziz became Khalifa, um, he deprived himself of many things. So he put aside much of this dunya. And he hadn't seen Umar for some time. So when he came to him, when he came to the house of Umar, he thought that Umar ibn Abdul Aziz was actually just a slave of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. He, he looked so different. And you know, you know, subhanAllah, you know, his hair looked, you know, was, wasn't as as uh, well-oiled and, and kempt as it used to be. His clothes were shaggy. The house that he lives in is no longer a palace. It's a mud house. And Ka'ab was shocked. And Umar said to Ka'ab, he says, أَتَسَوَّرُ جَسَدِي بَعْدَ ثَلَاثَةِ أَيَّامٍ فِي الْقَبْرِ وَقَدْ تَعَفَّنَ وَأَكَلَهُ الدُّودِ He said, if you think this is that, he said, imagine my body three days after death. Right? Imagine going into the grave three days after death. Um, and the body becomes decayed. And, and it's chewed up by the insects. And he says, and he says, and that is the day that concerns me more. Right? You know, that's the, situ- that's the situation that, that I actually care about. How am I going to look then? You know, that's, that's what I'm focusing on. Right, so it doesn't matter how much you you can what what front you can put up in this world, but whenever you're in the grave, I mean, what's left? Everyone decays. Of course, we don't except for the Anbiya and the Shuhada, but I mean, everyone decays. Right, you're going to be eaten up by worms. So how does Allah see you at that point? Okay, so it's it's a good reminder for yourself to to remember that everything becomes worthless and wasted, including your own body. And then, so what's important at that point is to focus on ikram and nafs wa ikram al you know, honoring, dignifying the soul and the self. And subhanAllah, it's important to focus on how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees you. So it goes back to that same level of introspection. And subhanAllah, you know, if you look at Umar bin Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the day that he was dying, uh, his head, and this is the most powerful man in the world, this is the Khalifa, Amir al-Mu'mineen, the most powerful man in the world. And his head was in the lap of his son, Abdullah. And he says to Abdullah, he says, put my head in the dirt so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may look at me and feel pity for me. SubhanAllah. Allah would look at his servants and would feel pity for him. SubhanAllah. Because why? You know, that's that's humility. That's coming to Allah with humility. 
That's the understanding of man tawadu alillah rafa'ahu Allah, the one who lowers himself for Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raises him and adorns him. Okay? So in essence, you know, in conclusion of, of this topic, you know, just taking the three things that we just talked about, um, so as far as the facets of, of battling pride and arrogance, you know, the idea here is that you need to know your, you need to know yourself, you need to know Allah, and you need to remember death. Okay? Know yourself, meaning your insignificance, your imperfections. Know Allah, meaning His perfection and His ultimate significance. And know death, meaning the insignificance of this dunya and everything that it comes with. Right? And that's why this is such a perfect um, equation here that Islam gives to us. Right? Knowing Allah, knowing ourselves, and knowing the dunya and, and how worthless it is and everything that comes with it. So just a little bit of an action plan. And this is what's really important. You know, so basically what we find from, from the lives of the Salaf is that the goal here is to find as is to do as much good as possible without being noticed by the people and without becoming too amused by yourself. So that can be accomplished with two things. Number one number one is private muraqaba and muhasaba, sitting with yourself privately, recognizing your sins and your faults. Number two Secret good deeds. Secret good deeds. You want to do as much good as possible without getting noticed. Okay? Secret good deeds. Um, and so an action plan that I would give for you, just for tonight, for example, just try this out. Choose a good deed to do tonight in secret and remind yourself how much Allah has done for you. Okay? So choose a good deed to do tonight in secret, whether it's some, some sadaqah, a small amount of charity, it's, it's some rak'at, some, some fasting, something good. That's just between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then after you do that, in order to protect yourself, remind yourself of your sins and remind yourself of how much Allah has done for you, even though you did not deserve it. Right? So in that way, again, and this is especially, you know, I, I recognize that this is a sister's halaqa. A lot of times, then, and this is an unfortunate reality on a community level, that, you know, the sisters do not get the same amount of praise and recognition, um, you know, nor are they out on, on the front lines um, you know, uh, as much as, as or, and that's not because of any um, incapability or in, in, incapacity on the part of the sisters. Actually, the sisters are much more active and much more energized and more uh, determined to learn than the brothers usually. But again, you know, just just because of culture, or whatever it may be, the sisters don't have you know that that level of recognition and respect sometimes. But Subhanallah, I mean, look at the recognition from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala more than anything else. And, you know, even just within itself, even though, you know, a woman's function is not just to be a mother and a wife, it's not just that, but there is no doubt that, you know, that the greatest reward is in motherhood, for example. You know, why? Because you're an institution at that point, you know. And subhanAllah, the mother might be unrecognized and unappreciated, but subhanAllah, she's an institution at that point. The point is, is that don't belittle what Allah has given you to please him, that will be unappreciated by people, but that will be appreciated by him. Don't just look for the glamour. Don't look for the fluff. You know, look for what's going to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the things that can have maximum effect. Um, as the Prophet said, do not belittle any good deed and focus on those things also, inshallah ta'ala, so that you can, you can uh, do away with that arrogance and pride. And it is crucial, as I said, every single one of these forms of arrogance <clears throat> and pride includes an overindulgence, um, an overindulgence in what is, um, you know, in, in what's going on in other people's lives. So our circles and our discussions and our gatherings should have nothing to do with the doubt, with the shortcomings of everyone else, but rather they should be focused on bettering ourselves. And if you're not leaving that gathering a better person, um, than, in, than it's a gathering that you don't need to be in. Okay, if you're not leaving from a gathering and a, and a better, as a better person, it's a gathering that you don't need to be in. Okay, and it's going to be a source of regret on the day of judgment. Um, so, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to go, of course, we're going to go ahead and take, um, we'll take some questions, inshallah ta'ala. I do want to mention, though, just quickly, if it's okay, I, I, I apologize, I didn't get a chance to talk to the sisters before this, but inshallah ta'ala, um, for those of you that know, I do teach classes online. <clears throat> on a university level, Mishkai University, but on a more on a, on a, on a, and on a routine level, 
um, with ILF, with Islamic Learning Foundation, ilftexas.org. Um, and one of the classes that I'm going to be teaching soon, it'll be a seminar in Houston, inshallah ta'ala, in May, but it's very relevant to this topic, which is why I'm mentioning it here, um, is about how to maintain an iman rush. A life, it's, it's, the name of the class is actually maintaining a lifelong iman rush, because a lot of times after a class, after a halakha, you start to fall short, and you don't move forward. You don't get to progress. So inshallah ta'ala, that's a class that I'll be teaching, and it'll be online, inshallah. You can get more information on Facebook, or you can get more information through ilftexas.org. Um, and, you know, it'll be, it's very much relevant to this topic and to what you guys are doing also with, with Habibi Halakas. May Allah reward you all. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and adorn you with the beauty of Iman. Allahumma ameen. And inshallah ta'ala, we'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll hand it back over to the moderator to see how we can take uh, questions. Jazakumullah khairan. The, the first question that came in, um, it's about the uh, I'm paraphrasing for brevity, that people, they're working for the sake of Allah, but they're afraid that it might be taken, uh, you know, taken as Riyah, or they, they get scared that people might think they're trying to show off. Um, so the sister's asking, should we stop doing that good work? Uh, where, what is, how to strike balance in, in, in doing good work and uh, being afraid of Riyah? Uh, so I think that the answer to the question is that the greatest form of riya is to leave a good deed um, because of fear of riya. It's actually a greater riya. Um, two reasons for that that the ulama said they said that one of them is that you know people would see that you stopped and you say oh I'm working on myself so say mashallah this person's being a zahid now so it can actually be a greater form of riya. The other one is at that point you're showing off to the shaitan. You're letting the shaitan know that he can dictate your actions because it's Shaytan who comes to you with these whispers and of insincerity and things of that sort. Uh, and that's why if a person finds themselves um, in, you know, feeling riya, they should keep on with the action and they should battle with the intention. But you never abandon an action, ever. Never abandon a good deed um, because of that fear, because that's the worst situation uh, to be in. Um, so work on reforming the intention. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz Allah said, if you're making sujood and shaitan comes to you and says you're only making sujood so that people can can praise you, he said, prolong your sujood even more. But as your public good deeds grow, your private good deeds also have to grow to be an effective, um, you know, counterpart, uh, you know, to, to those public good deeds. So your private good deeds, you should try to increase that, inshallah ta'ala. Um, but don't give up the public good deeds. Absolutely not. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. Um, there's another question very relevant to sisters, since this is a sister's halaka. Um, and this question comes from a sister. She says, I volunteer at my local masjid and notice that most girls who wear hijab, uh, it be- it's become an attitude of pride, a form of pride. I've noticed that they consider other girls who don't cover their hair or rather even body lower in faith towards them and insult them. How can we remove this problem from the ummah and become more accepting? This topic, I think that this topic is, is one that requires a lot of balance. Unfortunately, I see a lot of imbalance when it comes to the topic of hijab. So on one hand, Yes, there is, you do not want to judge sisters that don't wear hijab. You don't know their state before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and your state before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, on the other hand, the ruling on hijab cannot be mistaken. It's been the same ruling for 1,400 years, and it's only in modern times when we have these perverted interpretations that come out that people are saying, well, you don't have to cover the head and those types of things. So... Um, you know, so in essence, again, the idea here is that we have to find the balance between the two. Number one, uh, it's very simple. Uh, Iblis thought he was better than Adam Islam because of his ibadat, because of his good deeds. That was what he actually meant when he said, خَلَقْتَنِي مِنْ نَارًا وَخَلَقْتَهُمْ مِنْ طِينٍ He used that as a cover-up to say that you created me from fire and him from dirt. But what he actually thought was that he was better because of his good deeds. Okay because of his worship and everything that he's put forth. And that's why he hated Adam Islam in the first place. Why does this guy get to come along and take all of this uh, all of this reverence? You know, when I've been worshiping you this entire time. 
Um, so the idea here is that if your good deeds are making you belittle people and take you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's a lot harder to be forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than a sin. At least that person might be forgiven for their sin and recognition of their state before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The other thing, so that's that's for the person who's looking down upon the other and things of that sort. Now, the other side of that, as far as acceptance is concerned, we have to accept people that they need to, you know, everyone should come to Islam as they are and as Islam is. So come to Islam as it is, as you are. Islam cannot change for people. Okay, people need to learn to change for Islam. The religion is perfect. And what that means is that, again, you know, for, for the individual, don't worry about what other people say about you and don't worry what other people, you know, how other people look down upon you and things of that sort. It's about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees you. Now, if a person does not wear hijab, does that mean that they don't love Allah and the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or that they're not beloved to Allah and the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? No, it doesn't mean that. I mean, when Nu'iman uh, was drinking alcohol and was getting drunk, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi said, that he loves Allah and his messenger, and Allah and his messenger love him. You know, subhanAllah, and that's a person who's drinking alcohol, right? I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a great testimony from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, you know, obviously the idea here is that the action of not covering the awra, whether it's the hair, whether it's the legs, whatever it may be, is certainly something that is not beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but we don't know the hearts of any individual and we have to steer clear of that and be very careful from that, not to say, not to pass judgment on anyone um, despite whatever they're doing. I mean, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi told Osama bin Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhu when Osama uh, saw a person in the battlefield and as, he was an enemy and then he said, Ashhadu wa la ilaha Allah wa ashhadu Muhammad Rasulullah just as Osama was about to kill him and he killed him anyway. And, I mean, obviously, it seems like this guy spent his life fighting Islam. Just the last moments, he just said the shahada to try to get out of death. But the Prophet ﷺ was upset with Osama. You know, he he, he admonished him. He told him, "Shakakta an qalbi." Did you check his heart? So, I mean, if if that's for a person who's in the battlefield actively fighting Islam, then what about a Muslim who's in the ranks of the Muslim trying trying to do good, but? you know, maybe falling short in this regard, you know, so it's important for everyone to look to themselves and how they're falling short. That doesn't mean you don't give advice to those sisters, but you give advice in a loving and beautiful way. And humility shows itself in the way that you talk to other people, and arrogance will, will translate into the way that you talk to other people also. Allahu Akbar. Jazakallah khair, once again, Sheikh. Um, and there's a lot of sisters um, asking for advice or pointers or tips on how to um, how to boil down this topic or how to teach their kids, uh, of, you know, uh, or teenagers uh, from suffering from kibaria or ojab. Like how 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 can they teach their kids about this topic? Do you have any advice for us, Michelle? Um. The first thing with, with the teaching of the kids is to involve them in service. Just to involve them in service. You don't do your kids a favor when when you spoil them rotten and you shelter them from any form of from any form of, of uh, adversity. Um, you know, engage them in service. Let them see people who are who are less than them in dunya, and let them serve people. Teach your kids to be the ones that are always serving people. Don't think, oh, my kids are better than everyone else and things of that sort. No, when you go to a gathering, you teach your kids that your kids are the ones that are going to be serving. Take your kids to the masjid to clean up the masjid one day. Take your kids to a park. You know, learn with your kids. Lead by example, number one. With your kids, inshallah ta'ala, everyone, you know, should get together and should um, should engage in these actions that, that truly bring down the self. And then just remind them. You know, remind them. I'm telling you, leading by example, humble parents, usually have humble kids. That's one one slip out, one attribute that you usually see um in the kids when the parents are like that. If the, you know, obviously there's the um just the natural teenager phase, you know, where <laughs> you know, where a kid thinks that they're better than everyone else and you know, and has is at a, a high level of arrogance. But generally speaking generally speaking, um, when a person shows 
um, humility. And when a person is a humble person, the kids adopt that same attitude and lifestyle. So, you know, lead by example more than anything else and service, service, service. Um, we have so many questions, subhanAllah, but I'm assuming this will be the last one, inshallah. Um, the question is about uh, when there's a group project going on or, you know, when you're at the, in the masjid board or when you're part of some committee and you disagree with somebody um, and sometimes, uh, you know, give or kick in that uh, how come my suggestion wasn't taken even though you think it was better. Uh, what is something you can do in that situation when people disagree with you or you disagree with people? Um, the main thing in disagreements is to never accuse the intention of the other person. You know, say that maybe that person misunderstood something, or maybe that person sees something in a way that I'm not seeing it. Maybe they, they're noticing something that, I, that I'm not, perhaps I'm wrong. And um, But again, never accuse the intention. You know, a lot of times in these board discussions, oh, uh, or in, or in halaqa or power struggles in the masjid, whatever it is, oh, this person's only doing that because they want fame. This person's always trying to be seen. That is actually shirk. That comes right under lamtun nas. Um, I think I posted this on Facebook a few days ago, right, to, that to judge someone's intention is to belittle them, and that's a form of shirk. That is judging them. What, but how, of course you're belittling a person when you say that person's only doing it for this and that person's only doing it for that and I bet they wanted to do this and what they were really trying to do and oh, they're always trying to do this. And this. So avoid discussion of anyone's intention. Recognize, that, recognize the other person as a partner, as a brother, as a sister that's trying to, to, to reach the same goal as you and never allow that view to change. And if your view is changing in that regard, then you need to withdraw yourself. Um, so never allow yourself. Shaitan will come to you and will tell you, oh, he's only doing it for this, he's only doing it for that. You have to be able to try to tune those thoughts out, not entertain those thoughts. And, you know, hopefully, you know, with your attitude of, you know, towards the person, towards the other person that you might have a disagreement of, look, you know, we're all trying to get to the same place. Is that Allah if your, your effort? I just see it in this way, and, you know, I'm not questioning anything that you do and, and things of that sort, hopefully you, you'll foster a better environment of brotherhood and sisterhood and ta'awun ala al-birri wa taqwa, working together um, for righteousness and taqwa. I think that's all the time we have. I want to make sure that we stick to the time that we had discussed. So um, I just want to say Jazakallah khair so much from uh, everybody. We've had a lot of people send in uh, you know, saying Jazakallah care to you and Jazakallah care from us at Habibi Halakas for uh, taking out the time and doing this for us and all of the sisters. Um, I, I, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to praise Baraka in your work and to bless you and your family with the best of um, health and iman. I mean, um, a lot of people have been asking that about the recording of this webinar and yes, it will be posted online in a few days, inshallah. So, Anybody who couldn't listen in or you missed something, uh, inshallah, with notes, it will be posted online. Um, I just want to go over our official sponsor again because uh, I, I realized the, there was some disturbance in the beginning. So our official sponsor for this webinar was Islamic Design House, the Canada branch. So do visit them on their website, islamicdesignhouse.com forward slash Canada. And keep an eye out on our website, habibihalakas.org. Uh, for some special offers coming up with Islamic Design House. Um, Sheikh, if you have any last words, uh, go ahead. But other than that, JazakAllah here so much uh, once again for doing this for us. JazakAllah to, to you for inviting me and, and for having me today and for everyone who attended. Uh, my last words of Nasiha is uh, to be consistent with these halakhas, inshallah, for everyone that's attending. Don't look to who the speaker is and don't look to what the topic is. You know, be consistent. You never know what point of benefit uh, you will receive. So consistency is a, main, is, is a, is a very, very important um, factor in, in spiritual development and growth. So keep it up, inshallah, whether it's with Habibi Halakaz or some other, you know, classes and things of that sort. Just always have that level of consistency and don't, don't you know, don't say it's the speaker, it's this topic and I already... I can't benefit from the speaker, and I've already heard this topic, so 
focus on that, inshallah. And jazakumullah khairan to all of you for attending. Barakallahu alaykum. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair to everybody who attended. We'll be in touch very soon through our Facebook and our uh, emails, inshallah. Um, assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Mm-hmm.